Uh, I'm going to talk about magnetospheres in general um, and the Earth being a specific example that we've studied in most detail. But actually, the Earth is the more complicated, partly because we know more about it, so therefore it seems more complicated. Um, but also uh, because it is actually a little bit more complicated in terms of dynamics and structure than some of the other ones. But before we do that, um, what I would like to know is what your area is. And this is not, I, you know, I read your CV, and I, we know as, as the people running this, but you don't know each other, maybe, what the breadth of fields of research that you all do. So those of you who do solar, stellar physics, and other stars, wave your hands in the air. OK. OK, good. Look around and see who your fellows are. OK. Uh, heliosphere, astrospheres, solar wind. OK, good. Reasonable number there, good. Now, how about Earth ionosphere, magnetosphere? OK, great. Uh, exoplanet or planetary magnetospheres? <laughs> He's put his hand up for every single one. You can, you can, you can, have, you can have multiple interests. That's OK. Hey, speak for yourself, dude. <laughs> OK, space physics, plasma physics, anywhere. Basic theoretical underlying physical theory, etc. OK, good. OK, others, have I missed anything? What have I missed? <laughs> what? <laughs> Who else had some other questions? Other, others. Wow. OK, OK, good. Yeah, yes. Climate. Oh, good point. Very good point. Yeah, atmospheric. And indeed, the last uh, lecture of the, of the school by David Brain will be about planetary climate. Yeah, including the Earth. Any others that I missed? OK, great. So the point I'm really trying to make here is there's a very broad group of people here with very broad interests. So although you may be thinking, oh my golly, this is so basic, um, for other people it's not so basic. OK, good. So let's think about magnetospheres. Um, we, uh, this diagram, you're, you're, the way you're supposed to read this is this whole magnetosphere of Mercury fits within the Earth. This whole magnetosphere of Earth fits within Jupiter. And then this whole magnetosphere of Jupiter is small on the scale of the heliosphere. And um, if you think about how the, planet, the magnetosphere of Mercury it scales with the heliosphere, it's many orders of magnitude. In the middle of the night, I was trying to work out the number of orders of magnitude. I think it's about seven orders of magnitude. And yet, Margie Kivelson has written a paper arguing that the structure of the interaction of the interstellar wind with the heliosphere is actually not all that different than the interaction of the magnetosphere with, with Ganymede. And so she'll be talking about the interactions with moons on Monday. Uh, but the basic physics of the interaction of a plasma with a, a body, whether it has a magnetic field or doesn't, uh, is really, once we're dealing with the general processes, can be scaled from object to object. OK, so we had some discussion from Sabina about um, planetary magne magnetic fields. And um, we know that Earth and Saturn uh, are, and, and Jupiter, pretty dipolar fields. And in the case of the Earth and Jupiter, the uh, tilt is about 10 degrees from the spin axis. Uh, and that with Saturn, we have uh, a tilt that is basically zero, very closely aligned as Sabina described, associated with the symmetrization due to flows inside. Um, but also notice that I put in here obliquities, that is tilt of the spin axis with respect to the orbital plane. And the seasonal <clears throat> effects on the Earth and Saturn are going to be substantial with very limited seasonal effect at Jupiter because um, the spin axis of Jupiter is pretty much in the orbital plane. Uh, the ecliptic plane, indeed, of uh, the planets. Now, when we look at Uranus of Neptune, of course, um, the offset tilted dipole approximation is very poor. It's a highly non dipolar, complicated magnetic field. And of course, Uranus is tipped on its side, so huge seasonal effects. Uh, but 
These uh, magnetospheres are much more complicated, and I hope to just briefly mention them at the end. Sadly, we know very little about them. So let's start off with a rate. Yes. It, all of these objects, their angular momentum is huge, and so they remain pointed in some direction. So for the Earth, it's Polaris and... Oh, sorry. Okay, so how does the spin axis of Uranus vary in its orbit? It remains pointed at some star. Earth is Polaris, Uranus, I don't know, it's some blah, 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 blah star. Okay, good question. Um, so yes, the seasonal effects are huge, and I hope to come to that uh, at the end. Okay, so let's go to the radiation belts. And here we are, we have 1958 Van Allen here in the middle with Pickering, head of JPL, and Von Braun, um, the rocket man, uh, with Explorer 1. And I'm showing you this because we're going to talk about the radiation belts um, and how cool it must have been to have been on that very first uh, rocket experiment that the US did. Um, and so <laughs> you need to go here and see this, because uh, this is me down here, next to the rocket. Go check out these rocket parks. They have this Explorer 1. This is where they commanded them. Look at it. It's so cool. Go there. Go to Cape Canaveral and check it out and have your picture taken. Um, ma making a silly gesture. OK. You know what I meant. OK. So let's talk about the radiation belts a little bit. And um, Thomas Gamboshi uh, went through the adiabatic invariants uh, that describe particle motions around the field, bouncing up and down, and then drifting around and these time scales, you can see, this is for the Earth, are uh, gyro frequencies are very short, bounce periods a little longer, and then the drift periods are as much as minutes. And the important point here is that if you have um, uh, fields that vary slowly or relatively constant compared with these gyro and uh, bounce and drift, then you will, uh, the corresponding invariant will be conserved that's why it's called an invariant. But of course, if you have variations in the fields on these time scales, you will violate those invariants. Okay, and this will become important as we will discuss a bit further. And of course, for a dipole, I'll remind you that we define an L shell as the uh, the description of this uh, magnetic flux tube. The furthest crossing point is our. our furthest point from the center of the planet for a dipole field is our L shell. So let's think about the radiation belts. And this was introduced a little bit. Here is a plot showing as a function of L shell and energy. So this is energy across here for 1 to 14 MeV electrons, for example. And this is L shell here. Um, we have this distribution of flux here. And you can see that we have protons and electrodes. Uh, a little different. And you can see this is described usually in this canonical picture of different radi inner radiation belt and outer radiation belt uh, in these two regions. So when you look at a variation as a function of time, so this is L shell again, but limiting the energy range, in this case greater than 2 MeV electrons, you see this outer belt and the inner belt, but they vary with time, coming and going over uh, uh, the days here. And there's a whole variety of time scales on which things vary, basically associated with perturbations in the, in the magnetosphere. So I have a question for you. We're sitting on a satellite. We have a detector that, or we're virtually sitting on a satellite. We're, we're, we have a detector that measures particles in a range, say, four to six MeV electrons. What are the physical processes that might cause the measured flux as a function of time to change? Ideas? Precipitation. What causes the particles in that energy range to precipitate? So you might have change in their pitch angle. What could be causing change in their pitch angle? That's the angle. Sorry? Wave particle interaction. So you could have wave particle interactions that takes those particles that you're measuring and um, scatters them into a loss cone. They disappear into the planet's atmosphere. What else could be happening? 
You're measuring at a particular energy range. Sorry? So when you're going like this, you mean what? I think what you're trying to say is transport in and out of your physical location, right? So you're sitting at a particular location, and these the energetic particles could be transported out of your physical location, right? So there's transport in, in or out or past you, or your spacecraft could be moving through a boundary, right? Okay, so what else could be change the number of flux in your, your window? Right, very good, indeed. So either you're passing through the boundary or boundary is passing over you. And of course, with a single spacecraft, it's very hard to separate those two. That's why we have multiple spacecraft going out into space, like Cluster and Themis and MMS and so on. OK, any other ideas of how? You're looking at a particular energy range in a particular location at flux. We've had loss of particles due to precipitation. We've changes in the energy distribution, right? So we're looking at a particular energy band. You could lose energy. Maybe it's radiated in some way or giving energy to waves, in which case it would get out of your pass band. Or there could be some way in which particles are accelerated and heated and put into your energy range, OK? So you need to, when you see a variation as a function of time, you have to think about the variety of processes. You've got source processes, loss processes, energization processes, and then boundaries, physical transport processes. So here we have a canonical picture with the two um, inner and outer radiation belts. The outer belt, you have particles transporting from the outside of the magnetosphere. Cons if you conserve the first adiabatic invariant and you move into more energetic, uh, uh, sorry, higher magnetic field, right, higher magnetic field, you'll end up moving into um, a, a faster gyro motion. You'll, um, and then, uh, then there's also wave heating that will heat them up. So as the particles come in from the outer magnetosphere, they heat up, and we end up with these energetic uh, main radiation belt on the outside. The inner radiation belt, the protons are produced by cosmic rays interacting with the atmosphere. And then the point, though, is that as these particles come in, energized from outside, at some point, waves uh, scatter them into the loss cone, and they get lost. They precipitate down. Uh, onto the atmosphere. Okay. So um, there's a whole load of uh, ways in which particles are accelerated in the outer magnetosphere. I'm not going to go into this uh, for the Earth. Uh, but as they get, they are brought in and populate this uh, radiation belt. Now, I just want to show you the RBSP, the most recent uh, Van Allen probes um, uh, spacecraft data. Uh, the, the RET instrument that was built in those labs that you visited at LASP, um, they were built and put on these two spacecraft. We have, uh, and here you see their orbits put into this coordinate system. So this is distance from the planet and uh, vertical distance. You can see um, that there are two radiation belts here, the bright red here and the lighter red in here. And then as these are different epochs as a function of time, this is time for different en energy ranges. And you can see there was a lot of excitement that back last September, or two Septembers ago, um, there were three radiation belts, one, two, and three. And you can then think about what combinations of energization, transport, and loss could have led to this configuration. Particles coming in from the outside, being lost due to uh, wave particle interactions leading to precipitation. Now, I want to move on to other planets, and of course, I want to talk about Jupiter because 1959, around the time of Explorer 1, uh, we were starting to get observations of radio emission. Uh, this is 10.4 centimeter radio emission from Jupiter. And what we're seeing here is synchrotron emission of tens of MeV electrons. So these electrons are gyrating around the magnetic field, and they send out, these are relativistic electrons, and they're sending out synchrotron emission in beams perpendicular to the magnetic field. So over here, you're going to see stuff uh, emitted here. And then at high latitudes, you'll see some 
for those particles that bounce up to higher latitudes. Synchrotron emission, how it actually works, you know, I don't. But it's a, these are relativistic. The actual physical process of how you convert kinetic energy of the electron into radiation, I don't know how it works. It's the process of kinetic to radiation. Right, so this is radio emission that is emitted. And no, I don't know exactly how it works. So it's not like no, 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 this is not collisional. This is just re relativistic electrons gyrating around the magnetic field uh, and, and emitting uh, radio emission, right. photons. Well, I'm hearing three people talking at once. Finish what you're saying. Sorry. Right. I agree. Okay. The question, though, was what is the physical mechanism of, 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 gener of, of emission of, of radio emission? I don't know how that works. Because the electrons do exist. Yeah. Ah, uh, it's being accelerated. No, and it's. No, it's like the of yeah. Right. Okay, I think what we're finding, our collective knowledge here, wisdom, is telling us gyrating electron that is, is relativistic, being accelerated because it's going around, results in radio emissions. Okay, and the details are in a textbook somewhere. Okay, is that good enough? But the value is indeed in that this tells you it has a magnetic field. We knew back in 1959 that Jupiter had a magnetic field. We knew how strong it was. We knew that it was tilted by 10 degrees because the radio emission wobbled with a 10-hour um, period. Okay. So we, we are also able to look at radio emission from a variety of different ways. This is the VLA radio telescope south of here. This is the Cassini spacecraft on its way to Saturn making images of this radio emission at rather different different wavelengths. Uh, but what's interesting is that you can see there the pitch angle distribution of electrons in this region uh, is not just a simple uh, distribution. We have two populations, one which are highly uh, confined to the equator um, with a very pancake distribution. But there are also some that are, tend to uh, be populated at high latitudes where, in fact, you're removing the ones uh, near 90 degrees because there's a moon there that absorbs them uh, near the equator. OK, uh, but there's another factor about radiation belts, which is they're nasty and dangerous. Uh, and indeed, these relativistic electrons are very damaging to sensitive electronics. And so when the Juno spacecraft gets there uh, in two years' time, uh, it'll go into orbit It'll go over the radiation belts, duck under over here, and then come around, uh, avoiding the radiation belts, but getting very close to the planet. Uh, the problem is, though, because of the flatness, the rotational oblateness of the planet, um, the orbit will naturally process from being equatorial to higher angles. And at some point, somewhere around, we think about orbit 30 or so, it will begin to go through these radiation belts and die. We anticipate that it won't survive going through the radiation periods. OK, but this is going to be an important mission. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later uh, in terms of the magnetosphere and trying to understand what's going on. Finally, let me just mention for these radiation belts, uh, at Jupiter, unlike the Earth, where you saw that very dynamic changes that RBSP uh, probes measured, due to all sorts of time scales, due to the changes in the magnetosphere, there's basically just a factor of two at most variation over decades that we've been observing these emissions. And the biggest effect was back here in 1994, when there was a dramatic change due to the Shoemaker-Levy 9 uh, comet going through the radiation belts and all the debris um, 
interacting with these radiation belts. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about magnetospheric size. What determines the size of a magnetosphere? Well, we know that we have supersonic flow coming in from the sun, we, out from the sun, coming into the planet. We have an obstacle, which is the magnetic field, and we want to think about what determines this subsolar magnetopause standoff distance here, distance from the center of the planet to the magnetopause at the subsolar point, which we will call Rm or Mp. And uh, there's an upstream bow shock, because this is supersonic. It has to go through a transition here. Um, the bow shock tends to be about 1.3, in the case of the Earth, times the magnetopause distance. And this bow shock is where you take kinetic energy of this supersonic flow. We talked a lot about the solar wind being supersonic and having a lot of kinetic energy. But you're converting that into thermal energy as it, and then deflecting um, the plasma around. So upstream here, in fact, the pressure the, here is in fact about a little bit less than the uh, upstream conditions, but it's rel pretty much the same as the upstream conditions. So let's think about what we're doing. We have a roughly dipolar magnetic field. Uh, I'll point out that this is uh, this whole derivation of magnetospheric size and dynamics is is discussed in full in some of the earlier lectures from previous years, uh, but I'm going to summarize this and go through it um, fairly quickly. Um, if you put this dipole and you put it into an external field in the opposite direct in the same direction, you would end up with currents around it um, that would end up with a field around here that's uh, about three times the dipole. If you put in an uh, oppositely directly uh, um, field, um, the image dipole, whoops, I haven't, <laughs> wait a minute, I got this wrong, this is, but yeah, this is a southward, external southward field, you end up with um, twice the dipolar field on the boundary. So usually what we do when we derive the size of the magnetosphere, we take this magnetosphere, this is from Craven's text, but all the textbooks have the same sort of derivation. You have kinetic energy of the solar wind, you have the magnetic energy of the internal dipole, you have the ram pressure balancing the internal magnetic field pressure, and so you write this equation for this balance of the kinetic energy and the uh, magnetic field energy. And notice that I've got the surface magnetic field B0, which is the equatorial value of the field. And then because it's a dipole, drops over as 1 over r cubed. And so if we square it, it'll be 1 over r to the sixth. And I've normalized it to the planetary radius rp. But what we need to do is we need to uh, double the strength of the field here to account for these currents on the magnetopause. This is the um, sort of fairly standard mirror uh, dipole approximation. And you end up with a formulation of this balance between rho uh, v squared and the internal field pressure. You solve for the magnetopause distance. And this is what you get, a familiar, perhaps, um, expression describing how what the standoff distance depends on, which is the internal field strength and the uh, upstream magnetic field. But of course, notice this one sixth power, which will dampen this and make it a less sensitive to variations of the things inside. Yes. Okay, indeed, and we will be looking at this. So I've been a little sloppy here. There are better derivations of this in the previous discussions. You'll be explained with this in the, in the labs. But I'm keen to do comparisons when you're looking at very different situations, um, both the magnetospheres we know and potential magnetospheres, say, of exoplanets. So we take this situation. We have a, um, a, a, this description of basically the RAM pressure balancing the internal um, field, and so you end up with this expression here, which is often called the Chapman Ferraro distance, uh, going back to the 1931 paper that they wrote back then. Okay, so question What happens when these things vary? So let's start off with how does the solar wind vary with distance from the sun? 
10 seconds, talk with your mates. Okay, what is the answer? One over R squared, great. Okay, how does the solar wind vary with distance from the sun? Ooh, approximately. With distance. Not so much time, but distance. Pretty much constant once you get beyond the alpha point, okay? Okay, so now, how does this quantity, one over the sixth root of um, density times b squared, which is this quantity inside here, how does that vary with distance? One third, right? So what we're finding is that if, for a given magnetic field, we took a dipole or a planet and we move it around in the solar system, then you can see it's actually not a very strong um, dependence on distance. But if you go all the way out to Uranus and Neptune, then this quantity gets to be quite uh, substantially different from, say, 1 AU of the Earth. And so what does that mean for the size of the magnetosphere if we were to take Earth out to Uranus and Neptune? It'd be big, right? It would be a bigger, bigger size. Keep that in mind when we get to the outer magnetospheres. OK, so we think about Jupiter. We have a very strong magnetic field, huge magnetosphere. We actually also will talk about the dumping of material into it. But you take this whole magnetosphere of Earth, it would fit within the planet, more or less. OK, so let's think about what happens. We do our scaling relation. We go and look at our planets. We look at the strength of the field at their equator. Not all that different, bigger at Jupiter, much less at Mercury, but, but otherwise pretty similar to the Earth. You calculate the standoff distance using our chapman ferrari relation up here. And indeed, this is what you observe. So you will see that for four of the planets, it pretty much matches up. And for Jupiter and Saturn, however, we have a substantial difference, almost a factor of two difference between the theory and the practice for uh, Jupiter, and a number that is mm, not clear how different it is, and this is something that I think Nathan is struggling with in his uh, working on. Yeah? Well, yeah, 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 okay. Um, so this is using average conditions, and I believe I was there. I think I can remember the conditions were a little strange. We had a very high mark, it's the highest mark number shock that I published in a paper um, observed in the, in the solar system, Se mark 17. Um, so I think actually we had a very high ramp pressure. And so that makes sense that it's a little smaller on that particular one occasion when we flew through. Excellent question. Any other questions? OK, so the question obviously is why? And the answer is, another way of putting this is to draw these together with where um, the, the, the size that you would get for a, a uh, this is a dipole standoff distance. And the answer is you've got hot plasmas that inflate the magnetospheres of uh, Saturn and particularly Jupiter inside. So when you take for the dipole and you have a ram pressure, the size of the magnetopause varying is the sixth root of rho v squared. And um, with Jupiter, it's more like a third or maybe a fourth. There's some debate about the exact number here. Um, if you then uh, increase the solar wind by a factor of 10, you get a, a fairly small change. The Earth's magnetosphere is quite rigid in its response to the solar wind. Uh, but for Jupiter, it's much more compressible, and you get a factor of two variation in the size of the magnetosphere. So let's think about the plasma inside. You remember our beta expression. It's actually on the board right there, nkt over b squared uh, to u naught. And um, so really, this is telling us the amount of thermal energy in the plasma compared with the magnetic field. And in the plasma sheet around Jupiter, we have numbers that are substantial tens. Um, and so very much dominated by a hot plasma in here. <coughs> 
Whereas at high latitudes, in fact, it's a very low beta plasma um, with a fairly empty. So when we think about the compressibility, we have to include not just the rho v squared and balancing the magnetic field, but inside we have this substantial pressure that is uh, of the plasma inside. Yeah. Okay, so the question is this, because Jupiter is more compressible, does it respond in an interesting different way than the Earth? And the answer to that is yes, very much so. It is very compressible, and indeed, you see big changes. Uh, now what it turns out is that probably by the time the solar wind gets out to Jupiter, it tends to be kind of bimodal, and you get compression regions and then a, a, a relaxation and um, the magnetosphere responds accordingly. Yeah, it's an interesting response. Yeah. Yeah. And what does the sun imply for the radio emission? OK, the radio emission. OK, look at the scale. This is 100 RJ, radius of Jupiter, the scale to the magnetopause. The radio emission is at 3, deep, deep, deep. In, you can't even really draw it on the scale. It's about the size of these dots, this dot in, on either side. Okay? It doesn't see the solar wind, really, to speak of. Ah, what if you had a hot Jupiter exoplanet and moves in close to the star, then you might see strong response. Okay. Now, as we will talk about, there's many different kinds of radio emission from Jupiter. We just talked about the synchrotron emission that's in close. Um, which, which is due to those energetic electrons, but there are other kinds which may be better for diagnostics of exoplanets. Good question. Why is it important for Jupiter, not for Earth? Hang in there, dude. We're just getting there. Okay. So, um, if we look at all the planets, you'll see that these giant planets, they have moons out there that are embedded in the magnetospheres. And this has important consequences. Quick question, though. What's wrong with this diagram? Kind of a cool picture, isn't it? It's nice. Not to scale. True. Good. Good. Yep. Not to scale. What else is wrong? What is off? The colors are off? Yeah. Good. <laughs> good. You're warming up. Think about how the solar wind moves out from the sun. These lines, what are these lines? Magnetic field, right? Sector boundary. How does the wind go? Radial. So it's not too bad for the Earth, but uh-oh, the graphic artist kind of got things wrong for Jupiter, right? I just toss that out there as a <laughs> the solar wind pulls the tail behind it. Should be over here. Okay, we'll come back to these things. Okay, so let's talk about plasma sources. For the Earth, uh, things are actually fairly complicated for the Earth. Um, we have an ionospheric source. We have a bit of a solar wind source, and there's a problem, of course, that if you have hydrogen, protons are protons are protons. Uh, helium's a little easier because usually the solar wind are alpha particles, doubly ionized, internal sources are singly ionized. And then oxygen, singly ionized oxygen comes from the atmosphere. And I think that maybe Rod will talk a little bit more about um, sources from um, the planet coming out. But they come out and they get mixed in with the magnetosphere, they get heated, accelerated, and ultimately pass back and um, through the magnetosphere. But it's a small amount, five kilograms a second, uh, in terms of total plasma. So the Earth is very much dominated by the magnetic field, uh, rather than the plasma source being an important factor. We go to Jupiter, that's very much not the case. We have these moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, and particularly pesky Io, that volcanic moon that is spewing out sulfur dioxide and volcanic gases, um, is a big producer of plasma. Indeed, we have about uh, a ton a second 
So that is a big truckload every second being dumped into the magnetosphere. And it's caught up in the magnet, becomes ionized, caught up in the magnetic field. You have a rotating donut uh, or torus of uh, uh, plasma, sulfur and oxygen ions that are emitting in the ultraviolet. So this is a real image taken by the Cassini spacecraft as it flew past Jupiter on its way to Saturn. And you can see the UV glow of sulfur and oxygen ions glowing um, due to actually electron impact excitation. Yes, at every 10 hours, the um, magnetic field rotates. And so this is a 10 hour for a one wobble. Total mass of about two megatons. Okay. Oh, an important point here is actually the time frame for removal of this plasma is quite long. 10 to 20, 10 to, sorry, 20 to 50 days. So quite long. You put it in here, it hangs around for a long time. Think of that compared with the cycl cycling time at the Earth. The cycling time of, of stuff through the Earth is more counted in, in minutes to hours rather than in many days. Okay, very different system. So where does the energy come from to make stuff radiate? Well, the energy comes from iron pickup. Margie Kivelson will talk a little bit more about this. We have electrons bombarding a neutral atom. So in this case, we do have collisions, electrons bombarding the neutral gases that come from EO, ionizes them. The inner magnetic field that is into the board here, you have in the equatorial plane, you have an iron that gyrates like this with a large iron gyrate radius, little electron going like this. You get effectively a little bit of a charge separation that can lead to a pickup current. Uh, but more importantly, you have to think about it. The magnetic field couples the, the plasma to the spinning planet. You're extracting energy from the planet. And the iron gains gyro motion uh, as, it, uh, as it's picked up. Another process that happens is charge exchange. So there are some collisions. It's not entirely collision-less. But when you've got a time frame of weeks, you can have fairly low level of collisions and still have an important effect on the physical chemistry of the system. And so what you do is you have a neutral atom. So you have an iron, say A plus, comes in, hits a neutral atom B. You ionize the B, starts gyrating. And the A becomes neutral, no longer confined by the magnetic field, and comes whizzing off as an energetic neutral atom. An energetic neutral atom imaging of a system is now being used to try and understand plasmas, particularly at the outer planets, and, and to see what's going on. It's one way you can see stuff by looking at the energetic neutral atoms that come away. Again, you are extracting momentum from the plasma that is coupled to the spinning planet. So it's the way in which energy is added into the system. So let's look at this. This is a messy diagram. It's got a lot of stuff on it, but let me talk you through. We look at Jupiter, we have Eo at about 6RJ. At Saturn, we have Enceladus at about 4 Saturn radii. They both spew out stuff. In the case of Eo, it's uh, sulfur dioxide and sulfur. They get uh, sulfur monoxide. They get broken up to produce sulfur and oxygen uh, neutrals. This is a big cloud that gets spread around of neutral um, atoms and molecules away from EO, around EO's orbit. And I've got Europa's orbit out here. So you can think of Europa actually being orbiting in the effluent that comes from EO. Saturn, we have plumes from Enceladus spewing out uh, water products and, and uh, ice particles that spread out into the system. And the neutral clouds from uh, Enceladus get puffed out. There are neutral, neutral collisions, actual collisional processes. There's a dense enough amount of this to spread things out. And there's charge ex exchange processes that lead to puffing out the cloud away from Enceladus. So rather than being confined at four, it actually spreads all the way out um, throughout the magnetosphere. And in fact, it can be uh, observed either in the UV or from uh, Herschel. So we know that there's an extended cloud around um, uh, Saturn. Now, 
If you look at the total amount of neutrals, uh, it's relatively small at, at Jupiter, but the total amount of ions is substantial. Let me sh oops, sorry. Let me go back. Um, but what's important is to notice this. Look at the bottom line here. In the case of Jupiter, you have a lot of ionization, so ions dominate over neutrals by a lot, 50 to 1. Many more ions than neutrals. The ions get quickly ionized, electron impact ionization, and uh, remove the, the neutrals. They become ionized and trapped in the magnetic field. In the case of Saturn, the neutrals dominate over the ions by 100 to 1. So you can barely call this an ionized plasma. You know, it, it is an ionized plasma, and the ions do follow plasma physics. But you have to realize that there are a lot of interactions between the ions and the electrons and the neutrals um, that basically uh, it's less plasma physics, more uh, atomic and molecular physics. So in some ways you might think of this being a bit more behaving like an astrophysical uh, cloud, gas cloud, than um, a magnetosphere. So when we look at the torus, the ionized part, and here is those UV emissions again, EUV emissions, um, observed by Cassini. We tip the torus on the side. You see it wobbling about. These are different emission lines. These are sulfur emission lines, oxygen emission lines, a bunch of more ones over here. The aurora, by the way, are, of the planet are in the middle here. But what you see is this dense region where there are up to uh, a couple thousand particles per cc, close to EO, spreading out. Uh, whereas at Saturn, you have much less. You have um, uh, maximum density is on the order of 100 per cc, uh, and the total product of plasma here is tons, whereas over here it's more like tens of kilograms. A um, lot of UV emission. The energies are substantial in here. Over at Saturn, the energies are much less, and there's no UV uh, emission to speak of. If we look at the composition at higher energies, we can observe. Uh, it's easier to actually get the composition at higher energies. Uh, and what we see at Earth is uh, stuff that comes from the solar wind and then products that come from the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Jupiter, we have stuff from the solar wind again, but a lot of these products of sulfur and oxygen from EO. And then out at Saturn, we have the water products um, that substantial amount of water products that add to material that comes um, inside, penetrates in the solar wind. So let's think about the flow, the mass flux. We have a source at EO. We have a neutral source. We have uh, ionization, uh, electron impact ionization. Um, and then we lose some particles due to fast neutrals, that, that charge exchange process. And then some of the plasma is transported out. And indeed, what we get is about 50-50. About half of the material is lost as fast neutrals. Half the material transports and moves out. In the case of Saturn, again, we have a strong neutral source. But most of those particles, 95% of them, are lost as fast neutrals. So it's a very neutral dominated system. And only about 5% of those are transported out into the magnetosphere. If we look at energy, this is a little bit more complicated, but I'll talk you through it. You, we have this pickup process uh, that happens um, of the ions, uh, puts energy into the ions. They pick up energy. They then couple to the electrons. What do we call that process of transferring energy from ions to electrons? It's, I've got coupling here, ion-electron coupling. There are processes between charged particles. They don't actually hit each other, but because they're charged, they can move at fairly large distances, but still transfer momentum. Coulomb collisions, right? Have you heard those Coulomb collisions that act at larger distances than those billiard balls that bump into each other? So Coulomb collisions 
transfer the energy from the ions to the electrons. And I like to think, I learned plasma physics from this guy, Bruno Coppi, at, at MIT, and he's Italian. And he would talk about, it's the tracks and the bicycles, the tracks and the bicycles. I'm not a very good accent, but you get the idea. And you ha in, in fact, the mass ratio is about right. The ions are the trucks, the electrons are the bicycles. And if you're a cyclist, you have a visceral sense of the relationship of masses between these two, and you don't want to get hit by a truck. Right. So the ions are con conveying their momentum to the electrons. There's also some electrons, hot electrons, throughout the universe. There are these hot electrons. Hot electrons just seem to be all over the place. That is, the distribution function is usually not a Maxwellian. Usually it has a tail at higher energies. And all sorts of ways in which those high energy tails can be produced. I usually just say it's waves. You know, plasma physicists will come up with 101 fun ways of making hot electrons, right? And they go off and they do all their equations and blah, 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 blah. basically they just make hot electrons. Okay? So you can in, you can delve into the details of how it happens, but there are always ubiquitous hot electrons in our in, in plasmas. Uh, and this is a way in which, you know energy is added to the electrons. And so in the case of Jupiter, the energy comes from ionization through the ions and then is radiated out as UV emissions. And I'll bet you there are many astrophysical plasmas where this is very similar sort of processes occur. At Saturn, of course, most of the energy is carried away by these fast neutrals spread out into the system. So, in fact, this whole process of Enceladus spewing out neutral material, these plumes that send out water, are in fact extracting momentum from the spin of Saturn and sending it out as fast neutrals into this big extended neutral cloud. And the magnetic field and the plasmas are just an intermediary in this process. So finally, to just look at the plasma sources summed over all the planets, we have these very strong sources at Jupiter and Saturn, and the rest are pretty minor by comparison. 